introduced the book of Ephesians last week, tried to uh, give some background information, uh, some introductory uh, uh, information to help us to put the book in its biblical context, to help us to put it in its geographical context, to help us to have a better understanding. When we come to this book, we're not just picking up some random book uh, to try to read it, but that there was a purpose behind it. Uh, there were some recipients that needed this, uh, and that God had a very specific uh, design uh, behind the writing of this book. Just as by way of reminder, uh, the, the primary theme of this book that's gonna, that you're going to find running throughout this, you'll find all six elements uh, of this theme running throughout this book from beginning to end, is that God had an eternal purpose. God had an eternal plan in mind uh, and that, that he had from before he created the world. We're going to see some of that tonight. That before he created the world, he had a plan to redeem all of mankind. Before he ever made mankind, he had a plan to redeem mankind and to bring all of them together into what? Uh, he, he wasn't going to bring them all in together into Texas Stadium because they wouldn't all fit there, but to bring them all together in the church, to bring them all together in one body. That's When God redeems his people, he brings them together in his church. When God looks at his church, he's looking at those people that he has redeemed they are redeemed because they are in Christ, they are in His church. And then the last three chapters are really what's dealt with in the last point up here. As he talks to us about how we need to live uh, once we are in Christ. So I want to try to remind us of this each week because you're going to see this running throughout all of our studies uh, as we go through this. But when we come to the book of Ephesians, I'm not going to really repeat any more than that uh, from what we mentioned last week. If you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go back and uh, watch that lesson uh, just to get some more background information on the book. But really, there's a, this is a six-chapter book that you can divide in half as far as, uh, as far as the main emphasis of the book. The first three chapters are often looked at as a, as a doctrinal section. It's a little meatier uh, section as far as uh, teaching goes. The last three chapters are really looked at as a real practical section where you get into them, and there, there are things that you can readily make application uh, to yourself in those last three chapters. So... So I, I've divided these themes into that doctrinal section talking about the church uh, and, and the church is God's eternal plan. And then those last three chapters are, okay, now that I'm in the church, how do I live in the church? Uh, how, does God want we, how, how does God want me to behave and uh, to abide while I'm in the church? But that's, the church is the major theme of this book. Uh, if you, if you want to summarize the book of Ephesians in one word, that's it, church. Uh, that, that's the major overriding theme of this book. And so those first three chapters are uh, looking at God's eternal plan. Those last three chapters are, how, how can I live uh, once I'm in this, this, uh, this church? So tonight what we're looking at uh, is chapter 1, uh, which you can, you can summarize this in a number of ways. I've chosen to summarize it as the glorious nature uh, of the Lord's church. Uh, you could say it's the divine nature because it came from God. You could say it's the essential nature of the Lord's church because this isn't just some random uh, arbitrary or uh, take it or leave it kind of thing that the as we're going to see in this chapter tonight this uh, the church is essential uh, to the plan of God so with that bit of brief introduction let's talk about chapter one and let's talk about the glorious nature of the Lord's church um, I hope that when you study the book of Ephesians you fall in love with the church I hope when you study this book that it will become one of your favorite books of the Bible, not just a favorite book of the New Testament, just a favorite book of the Bible because of the way it elevates God's eternal plan to say, here's what God had in mind from the very beginning. You know, some people look at the church and say, well, I, you know, I'm not really interested in the church. That, you know, there's, there's, there, there's, but it's not a matter of whether I'm interested in it or not. Jesus was interested in it enough to die for it. That's how essential, that's how important it was uh, to Jesus. So I hope as we study through the book of Ephesians that, that you'll, you'll just fall in love with what God had in mind uh, for his church. And as Paul often does in the first couple verses of, of this letter, uh, he, he goes through some, just some greetings, his, his general greetings. And um, today when we write a letter, we usually sign our name at the end. Uh, so if you get a letter in the mail, you usually look down at the, who is this, who's writing me a letter? You're going to look down at the end to figure out who, who's this coming from. In that day, they put, they signed the letter at the beginning. So you didn't have to look all the way at the end. They just put their name right at the beginning of who was, who, who this letter was from. And so that's why you have these greetings right at the front end that he says, I'm Paul. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
Now, how did he become apostle? According to this, he became an apostle of Jesus Christ by what? By the will of God. Did he force himself into the apostleship? Did he say, you're going to take me whether you like me or not? It was the will of God by which Paul became an apostle. Now, that phrase, the will of God, you're going to see that, you're going to see that about three more times in this chapter where Paul emphasizes God's will. He says it right here, but you can see about three more times where he says, these things are done by the will of God. That's who's writing it. He's writing it to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful ones. So he's writing to the, who, who are the saints? Are they the people who live in New Orleans and play football? Uh, are they the people that uh, are voted upon after they die if they've performed a couple uh, of verifiable miracles that uh, we make them a saint? Uh, neither one of those are found in the Bible. Uh, the, the, the Catholic saints aren't in the Bible, nor the New Orleans saints found in the Bible. Uh, the saints that are found in the Bible are these living Christians. The word saints means that they, are, that they have been separated. They are the holy ones of God that he looks down. And you're going to find this word saints throughout this book and, and even in this chapter. Uh, you're going to find it, it at least a couple more times towards the end of the chapter. You're going to find this word saints, that he's addressing these living Christians who are living in Ephesus. And he says they're not only those who have been called out, the, the sanctified ones, but they're the faithful ones. Uh, they're striving to serve the Lord and, and to do as uh, he would have them to do. But here's what I want you to see at the end of verse 1. What are the last three words that you have in verse 1? In Christ Jesus. That is a key phrase in this book. Uh, you're going to find that phrase, in Christ Jesus, or in Christ, or in Him, or in whom, or you're going you're to find that phrase 35 times in this short book. It's a key phrase to say, now, what's the one word summary of this book? One word summary is what? Church. One word summary of this book is church. Now, what's the key phrase in this book? In Christ. Do those two things have anything to do with each other? Does being in Christ have anything to do with the church? Does the church have anything to do with being in Christ? Yes, they are one in the same thing. And so he addresses these Christians, these saints, these faithful who are in Christ Jesus. And I, and, and I said that that phrase is found 35 times uh, in the book. As we go through this first paragraph here of the book, that phrase is found 12 times just in the first 13 verses. Uh, some equivalent of that is found here and so that's that's how critical that phrase is we've got to can you be saved and not be in christ you can't be saved and not be in christ now here's something that trips people up can you be saved and not be in the church well can you be in christ and not be in the church no can you be saved and not be in christ so you got to be saved to be in christ you have to be saved to be in the church oh it's all the same you, you don't get to parse it and divide it out it's all the same thing, and, and I hope we'll see that as we go through this. Verse 2, it's a very common greeting uh, from Paul. You have the Greek expression, grace to you. You have the Hebrew expression, peace from God. And so God is the source of grace. He's the source of peace. Grace to you and peace from God. What's the word you have after God? Our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't just say that grace and peace are from God. That would be true. But he says, grace and peace are from my God and your God. This is a very personal relationship that we are to have with God, uh, as he emphasized in that verse. So that, that's a very customary um, greeting and, and salutation. Uh, each one of them for each book sort of has its own little flavor to it. Uh, but but I, I don't like to run over those things. We need to see and, and look at each word there. But th this next section is critical to an understanding of the book because what you find in verses 3 through 14 is, is that all spiritual blessings, the theme for this section is that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Now what's interesting is when you start in verse 3, you will not find a period in your Bible until you get to the end of verse 12. So you start in verse 3 and you're going to find a lot of commas and a lot of semicolons, but you won't find a period until you get to the end of verse 12. That's a long sentence, isn't it? Now, in some Bibles, you might have a period after verse 6, but in, uh, uh, in the Greek, it's not a period. It, there's not a period there. So this is just, and you might say, well, wow, that's a run-on sentence, and that's, that's not very uh, grammatically correct. Well, it's not a run-on sentence. Uh, Paul just had a lot to say. 
Sometimes preachers have a lot to say and they don't use a lot of periods. Uh, have you noticed that? They, they, just, they just keep on. Now, this is the Holy Spirit who's got a lot to say. And so he wants to, he wants to infuse as much information into this one section as he can about what it means. Now, the, the key phrase in here is what it means to be in Christ. And he's going to start in verse 3 by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our, there's that word again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, with what? All or every, depending on what translation you have, with all or every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies or in the heavenly places. Where are they? In Christ. If every spiritual blessing is found in Christ, am I going to find any spiritual blessings outside of Christ? Not a single one. If every one of them is in Christ, I know where they're located. So if I know where they're located, I absolutely know where they're not located. So can I enjoy any of these? We're not talking about physical blessings here. God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. There, there are physical blessings that come, upon, that come upon all people. But these spiritual blessings... These things that have to do with the soul, these things that have to do with a relationship between God and man, a special relationship, these are only for people who are in Christ. And so he begins this by saying, blessed be the God who makes that true. Now, the word blessed here means that God is worthy of praise. That, that here is the God who is worthy of all praise. He, and it's, it's actually the word, the Greek word here is the word that we would get the word eulogy from. You ever heard a, you ever heard a eulogy? Uh, eulogies is when you, it literally means you speak well of somebody else. That's what happens in a eulogy, right? You speak well, that's literally what the word means. And so that's, that, that's the word that's used here for blessed, is that we are speaking well of God or we are praising God. Now, look down in verse 6. How does verse 6 begin? To the praise of the glory of His grace. Drop down to verse 12. How does verse 12 end? To the praise of His glory. Look at the end of verse 14. How does it end? To the praise of His glory. Here's a section that says, We need to give praise and honor to our God for the blessings that He gives us that are only found in Christ. That's the only place that they can be found. And so what He does here is He enumerates uh, about, I think it's about seven. Um, uh, I can't remember my count here. We'll, we'll figure it out as we throw them up on the screen. It might be eight. Eight different spiritual blessings. And there's more than this. He's not trying to give an exhaustive list here. But he's trying to give us a flavor of what some of these spiritual gifts, or not gifts, but spiritual blessings are that are only for those who are found in Christ. Number one, he says in verse 4, is that one spiritual blessing we have in Christ is that he chose us. Where did he choose us? What's the word? two words you have after cho chose us? In him. He chose, and you might say it this way, He chose those of us who are in Him before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? What does it mean that God chose us? Boy, there's some people that come to that and say, well, if He, if he chose you to be a Christian, that must mean that He didn't choose this other person to be a Christian. So He wanted you to be a Christian, but He didn't want this other person to be a Christian. That's not what this means. He chose us who are in Him. Now, when did God make the choosing? According to verse 4. Before the foundation of the world. Before He literally threw down the, the foundation of the earth, He had already chosen those who would be in Him, who would be in Christ. Somebody says, that doesn't sound very fair. Why would He pick and choose? Now, hang on a second. That's not what's happening here. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that, so he chose the place, he chose those who would be in Christ, he chose the people, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Hang on, oh, turn your Bible just a second over to chapter 5. He chose us to be holy and without blame. Hold that thought. Let me find this verse in chapter 5. Look in chapter 5 and verse 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, the church, 
should be holy and without blemish. We just read that in chapter 1. What is to be holy and without blemish in chapter 5? The church. So what would then make sense to be holy and without blame or blemish in chapter 1? He's talking about the church. So he chose us who are in him that we should be holy and without blame in the church. Now tied with that, and I, and I want to tie these two together, is what he says in verse 5. He not only chose us in him, but he predestined us. Somebody, some people read that word and, and they trip on it. Having predestined us to adoption as sons. How did he do that? By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now let's stop here for just a minute and try to figure out what is he talking about. Spiritual blessings are only found in Christ. What's, what, are, what are some of the spiritual blessings? That God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That God predestined us to be his children. That he would adopt us into his family. And he, he wanted us to, do, to be his children. And so he did that, the middle of verse 5 says, he did that by Jesus Christ. Okay, so did God, as, as uh, John Calvin would teach, did God arbitrarily, before the foundation of the world, did he automatically say, well, Joe's going to be saved, but Janice is not, and, 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 and Mike's going to be saved, but Mark is not? And did God just go to, was he like Santa Claus, and did he just make a list and just throw people on different lists? Okay, well, you're saying no. Well, how is it no? Well, let's put, the Bible, let's put the Bible together in its entirety. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who did Jesus die for? Jesus died for the whole world. He loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son for the whole world. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says he tasted death for everybody. So Jesus died for the whole world. Is the whole world saved? Is the whole world going to be saved? Okay, no. That's, that's not it. So why would Jesus die for everybody if not everybody's going to be saved? Because God wanted, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 says, God wants all people to be saved. God longs for all people to, say, to be saved. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says he doesn't want anybody to perish. And so he gave to all of us a free will to make our own choices. And what does he long for us to do? He longs for us to be in Christ. Now, how does one get into Christ? If in Christ is where all spiritual blessings are found, how does one get into Christ? Does God arbitrarily throw somebody into Christ whether they want to be in there or not? No. You back up one book into Galatians 3 and verse 27, and it says that one is baptized into Christ. That's how you get into Christ, is that you follow the plan of God, you obey Him, and upon your obedience, you get into Christ. And when you get into Christ, you are God's elect. You are God's chosen. You are one of God's people. So why does it say that He predestined us to adoption as sons? Uh, pre predestined means that, that God marked out something before something else ever happened. Meaning he, he marked out, literally it means he marked out the boundaries. What were the boundaries? The boundaries were those who were in Christ, that's who he marked out. Those who were in the church, that's who he marked out. But God did not decide whether Joe or Bill or Johnny or Sue or or, or whoever was going to be in Christ. He didn't decide that arbitrarily. He just marked out the boundaries and said, here are the ones who are in Christ. Who's in Christ? The ones who obey me and are baptized into Christ are the ones who are in Christ. And I chose them to be my people. The ones who obey me, I've chosen to be my people. But what about those people who are outside of Christ? Did God not choose them? Well, God wants them but they get to make their own choice. Um, we, we've used this illustration before, but I, I think it helps us to understand this idea of God choosing before the foundation of the world and God predestining 
those who would be his sons and not uh, who, who would be his sons by, by way of adoption. Um, and, and there are a number of school teachers in here, and I, I think this illustration works well. We just started a school year. Do school teachers decide ahead of time which students are going to get an A and which students are not? Do you, do you decide ahead of time as a school teacher who's going to pass your class and who's going to fail your class? The answer, well, okay. For the, the right answer to that question, uh, I, I know we've got some weird teachers in here, but the right answer to that question is you don't. Because here's the deal. You don't know, you've already established the boundaries. You've already marked out the boundaries of who's going to pass your class, who's going to get an A in your class, or whatever, before you ever get a list of kids for your class. At least that's what you're supposed to do, okay? You, you've already marked out that whoever gets, and whatever it is today, they keep lowering the threshold for A's, so I'm not sure where it is in your class. But if you've already marked out the boundaries that say, this, if this person gets a 90 or above, they're going to have an A. So when, 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 you're, when some boy named Billy gets, gets a 92, did you predestine that he was going to get an A? Yep. You predestined that he was going to get an A by virtue of the fact that you marked out the boundaries of who was going to get an A. So anybody who got a 90 or above was going to get an A no matter who they were. You chose them to be the A students. Didn't even know their names. You predestined that they were going to pass your class before you ever saw your, your role list. How? You marked out the boundaries of what they had to do in order to accomplish that. Does that make sense? We understand that with teachers. What did God do? God said, I am choosing to be my children, those who are in Christ. I, want, I, I, I have chosen them. I have predestined to adopt them as my children. And in so doing, he marked out the boundaries. He said, Here are, here's what they need to do in order to be in Christ. And he leaves it up to us whether we will, follow, whether we will obey him uh, and do those things that he would have us to do. And the, at the end of verse 5 says, this is according to the good pleasure of his will. If you drop down into uh, verse uh, 9, you're going to see good pleasure again. By the way, there you see it talking about his will again. So this was the will of God from the very beginning. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, New King James says, he made us accepted in the beloved. When we follow God's will, when we follow God's plan and obey what he has us to do, he accepts us in Christ. Verse 7, verse 7 is one of the greatest verses in this whole, se in the whole, the whole section is, but verse 7 says, in him, there's that expression again, in him, what's another spiritual blessing? We have redemption. Well, redemption means that there, was some, that there was some purchase that was made. Redemption means that there was some price. There was some price that was paid. Redemption means that here, here was a slave and they had to be bought back out of slavery. So what was the purchase price of this redemption? It's right there, right? We have redemption through His blood what a blessing that is could we have redeemed ourselves could we have bought ourselves out of the slave of sin we couldn't have bought ourselves only the blood of jesus could spiritual blessing number whatever we're on we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our sins god removes he releases us uh, from our sins and those things that we've done according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence think about those the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us is there enough grace for all of us enough for every single one of us that's why jesus died in order that we might and and he goes here to talk about how he made known to us the mystery of his will and we're going to talk more about that mystery when we get to chapter three but uh the mystery here doesn't mean that it's mysterious. It doesn't mean that you have to have a decoder ring in order to solve the mystery. It doesn't mean that you have to look in the back of the book to find the, the, uh, uh, the answer. It's, mystery here just means it was something that wasn't revealed yet. But then God in Christ revealed His will, as this verse says in verse 9, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed 
in himself, in Christ. That in the dis dispensation of the fullness of the times, and all that means is when the right time came, when the right time came, he might gather together in one. Remember the theme of this book? Gathering us together in one place? That he might gather together in one all things. But where does he gather us together? In Christ. The end of the verse says it again. In him. And so God longs for us to be his children, to be in Christ, a part of the, his one uh, a part of his one body in Christ. And that verse just says that he had the time frame laid out. And when the fullness of time came, when the right time came to send Jesus in Galatians 4, and verse 4 says something very similar to that, he sent Jesus. One of the great spiritual blessings in verse, is in verse 11. In him also we have obtained, how about this spiritual blessing, an inheritance. If we are his sons, what do we have? We have an inheritance that is awaiting us, and this inheritance being was predestined as well, according to the purpose, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. In other words, God is working all of this out the way that God wants to work all of this out, according to the way that he had it planned from the very beginning. And it's not just his, the plan that he had to send Jesus in order to save us and to give us an opportunity to be saved, but this idea of God working uh, all things according to his will in verse 11. You, you probably know Romans 8 and verse 28 that says God works all things together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. That, that's, that's included here as well. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. That is our purpose in this life, is to be to the praise of of the glory of God. Verse 13, in him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, after you heard the gospel of your salvation, you trusted in him. Middle of verse 13, and whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now what in the world is that talking about? It's another spiritual blessing. How many is this? One, two, three, four. Is that eight? Eight spiritual blessings that he enumerates here. And that list is not nearly complete because you can add to that in other places. But he's trying to help us to see that when you're a Christian, when you're in Christ, think about it, that none of these blessings are yours outside of Christ. Not a single one. But only when you are obedient to the Lord and you come within those boundaries that he has marked out, that you become one of his children, and now all of these, not some of these blessings, all of these blessings become yours, including, in this passage, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what in the world is that talking about? Well, we've got, uh, we've got about six and a half minutes, and we've got the rest of a chapter to cover here. Um, but what does this mean about being sealed uh, with the Holy Spirit? What's involved in the Holy Spirit of promise? Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The Bible says, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And sometimes we don't finish the verse. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is that a promise? Well, verse 39 says it is. Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. This promise shall be to you. So that's a promise. Is that the Holy Spirit of promise? Well, would it fit here? The Holy Spirit of promise is promised as a gift in Acts 2 and verse 38 and 39. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32 says that the Holy Spirit was given to all who obeyed. Not to some, but to all who obeyed, the Holy Spirit was given. Okay, uh, what is that talking about? Well, is it, is it true that as a child of God, God dwells within us? That our body is the temple of God? Is it true that as a child of God that Christ in, in, in a form, not literally obviously, but Christ in a way dwells within me? Not I, but Christ lives in me, right? Galatians 2 and verse 20. So if God dwells in me and Christ dwells in me, what about the Spirit? Does the Spirit dwell in me as a child of God? Not in some mystical, crazy, whispers in my ear, tells me what to do, nudges me and tells me to go over there. That's not how, what the Bible teaches. But the Bible teaches that as I study by the, word, by the way, this is the book of Ephesians that calls the Bible 
the sword of the Spirit. So here's a book that is given to us by the Spirit of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit of God spoke as men were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's a book given to us by the Spirit of God. When we take this book and we write it upon our hearts, is the, is the Spirit of God dwelling in us through these words? Yeah, certainly. And so that's the Spirit of promise. And when God, when God looks down and sees His children, when God looks down and sees His children, He sees His children as being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. If the Holy Spirit is given to dwell within all of those who are children of God, and, and again, don't get the idea that, that the Holy Spirit is pushing you around or talking to you. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the God, that God dwells within us, and tie, you might go and read Romans chapter 8, verses 11 through about verse 17, uh, along with this. You might go and read Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, where the Bible says that our, the, the way that God sees us as His children is when He looks and sees His Spirit dwelling in us. When God sees His Spirit dwelling in us, He knows that we are His children by the fact that His Spirit has been given to us. So that's the seal that we have been sealed. Meaning that the seal in those days, think about the signet seal of a, of, of a king. The, the, the seal would guarantee, and that, that's the word that's used here in verse 14, that there was a guarantee that's involved but, but, but it, it, would, it would show with, with beyond any doubt, verifying I belong to God. If the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me, that means I belong to God. The Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in just anybody. The Holy Spirit only dwells in the child of God. So it verifies my sonship. It verifies my ownership that I belong to God. And, and, it get, and a seal back in those days would guarantee the contents. If, if you were to write a letter or put something in an envelope and seal it, that seal said, I am verifying the contents of this envelope are what they're supposed to be. When we're sealed by God's Spirit, it, it looks at the contents and says, I guarantee that this is a child of God. But is it possible that we could live in such a way that the Spirit of God no longer dwells in us? Yes, that's true, and, and we'll see that as we go. There's a lot that we could say about, and, and I, don't, I don't want you to go beyond anything that we've talked about as far as the Spirit dwelling within us. Um, but he's the guarantee, the verse 14, that's the word for down payment. It's the word for deposit. It's the word for pledge, meaning he, he is, this is the first installment. The spirit dwelling in us is just the first installment of our eternal redemption. If you think this is good, just wait until the redemption of the purchased possession when we all get to go to heaven together. Now, that's, that's, the, glo that's the glorious nature of the church and talking about all spiritual blessings being in Christ. As we wrap up, I've got two minutes here. The last part of this chapter, you could summarize it by saying, not only do all spiritual blessings are they in Christ, the last part of this chapter says those blessings are in the church. And I want you to tie those things together, that the blessings are all in Christ, and all of the blessings are in the church. And so this last part of the chapter is a prayer of Paul, where he says, I pray these things for you. I'm always praying for you. I'm always thankful for you. And he says, I want you to know the power of God. I want you to look just down at uh, verse 20 and uh, to the end of the chapter. He says, I want you to know the power of God. Power of God was involved in verse 20 when he raised Jesus from the dead. We don't talk enough about the resurrection of Jesus. You never could. But the, is that the power of God? Yes. He raised Jesus from the dead. Number two. He seated Jesus at his right hand, a place of authority. He raised Jesus from the dead. He exalted Jesus. You see the power of God. Verse 22, you see the power of God, or verse 21, in that far above, not just above, but far above, and not just some, but all, rule and authority and power and dominion. There's nothing on this earth or in the world to come that has any power or authority over Jesus. Every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, Jesus is far above all of them and, and being exalted above them. But here's what I want to see in the last two verses. Because here's where it comes to us. Does God have power? Yeah, you see it in the resurrection. Does he have power? Yeah, you see it in his exaltation of Jesus to his right hand. God have power? Yeah, he gave his authority to Jesus. Now what else does the power of God do? Verse 22. 
He put all things in subjection to Jesus. God put all things, not some, all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be head. Who's, who's head? Jesus. He gave him to be head over all, not some, all things. He put all things under his feet. So there's nothing that has not been subjected to Christ. He's head over all things. There's nothing that is above him that has authority over him. He gave him to be head over all things to the church. Here's the key word in this book. To the church. How many are there? Just one there, right? To the church, which is his body. The body is the church. Who's the head? Jesus is the head. If you got a head, you got a body too, right? And so if he's the head, what does he have? By implication, a body. What is his body? It's the church. Can I be, if he's the head, and this is, is this Christ? He's the head, and here's his body. Is this Christ right here? Head, body. Is this Christ? Do I have to be in Christ in order to have all spiritual blessings? I do. Do I have to be in his church, in his body, in order to have all spiritual blessings? Could I be in Christ and not be in his body? Mm, I don't think so. So he's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Now this last expression, and we're done. What is the church? The church is the fullness of Christ. Just let that sink in for a second. The church is the fullness of Christ. Is there any fullness? Is there anything outside of Christ for me? Nope. Church is the fullness. That means that it's the fullness, and it's the fullness of Christ who fills all in all. The church is where Christ fills everyone with all that they need. What's he talking about? The spiritual blessings. So the first part of this chapter says, in Christ, every spiritual blessing of God is found, but you've got to be in Christ to find it. The last part of this chapter says, in the church is where every spiritual blessing of Christ is found. And when you put those two things together, what do you find? The glorious nature of his church. I need to fall in love with his church. It is the purchased possession of verse 14 that he gave his own blood for in verse 7 so that I could be redeemed and have my sins forgiven. If I, if I am as interested in having my sins forgiven as I am in the church, can I have one without the other? I cannot have forgiveness of sins, that's by the blood of Jesus, and not be in his church because that's by the blood of Jesus too. I know there's a lot of content in this chapter. Go back and read it, study it some more. Next week I'm out of town, but two weeks from tonight, chapter two. All right, so you know what we're doing here. We're, we're, these first three chapters, we're going to do a chapter a week, and then we get to chapter four, we'll slow down just a little bit, but not by much. But uh, read chapter two, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Thank you all very much.